Good morning and welcome. Let's stand and worship together. Good morning, and welcome as we gather here this morning to worship. There are so many things that have happened in the news and in the world since we were here together for worship last week. Queen Elizabeth has died. We now have a new reigning monarch, King Charles. Our money will likely change at some point, I guess. There was the news of of all that happened with the stabbings in Saskatchewan. The war continues in Ukraine. There's a new leader of the Federal Conservative Party. There are elections upcoming in our area. You're starting to see signs around things are changing, things are happening. A lot has happened in the last week. We've gone back to school. A lot has happened. But in all of that, we're reminded that our God does not change. Things can change in the world. Things can happen in the world, but our God does not change. He is always faithful. He is always gracious to us. He is always great. 
as we just sang. He's always loving. He is always good. Even in the times when we struggle to see it, he is always good. Psalm 117 says, Praise the Lord, all you nations. Extol him, all you peoples, for great is his love toward us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. And so he is faithful through all the change that we experience. He is faithful yesterday and today and forever. And so we're here today to praise the Lord. To praise the Lord who greets us here this morning. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and Christ Jesus our Lord and Savior. And together we say, amen. And let's take a moment now that we have received God's greeting that he has brought us here into this place together to worship, to greet those around us in a way that we're comfortable. We can do a a fist bump. We can just greet the people around us, say good morning as we come into this worship service together. Good Good morning, Jacob. Good to see you.
And you may be seated. The proof of God's amazing love is this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Not when we got there, not when we did everything that we needed to do, not once we earned it, but while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And so let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in time of need. Trusting in God's faithfulness and compassion, let us confess our sin before God. Let's bow our heads together. Our loving God, as we gather together in this place, and as we take just this moment of silence, remind us again and again of your grace, even though we know that we fall short. Bring to mind those things for us that we've done against your will, that we've done wrong. Help us to be aware of them that we might bring them to your throne of grace for forgiveness. Our loving God, we confess before you and before each other that our lives are not pure and holy apart from the cleansing that we have from the work of Jesus, our Savior. And we confess that, that too often Jesus in us is hidden by our actions that wound rather than heal, that tear down rather than build up. God, open our eyes that we may see you in the ones we love that we may see you in the ones we say we love. Open our ears that we may be quicker to listen than to speak. Open our mouths to speak good rather than evil of our neighbors. Open our hands in generosity and help us to let go of clenched fists. And open our hearts to a desire to follow Jesus in full obedience to your will and your way. We pray all this trusting in your forgiveness and in the power of your Holy Spirit to lead and guide us in the paths of justice and righteousness for your name's sake. Amen. Let's stand and sing together.
Good morning, congregation. Uh, today's offering is for Hope and Healing International. Uh, Hope and Healing International cares deeply that children with impairments in the world's poorest countries and communities live healthier, happier, and longer lives. We know, we know from uh, evidence and experience that far too many of these children are dying lonely, uneducated, and abused. They are forgotten again and again by their communities, their governments, and far too often by development organizations. As Christians, we believe in the intrinsic value of God-given potential in every child. Help us 
to care for children with disabilities. We are doctors, teachers, health workers, community advocates, and funding partners like you. Passionate about giving hope and medical care to children and families trapped in poverty and disability. And you can find out more on their website. Give as you are able. More than 100 years ago, Pastor Ernst Christoffel, the founder of Christian Blind Mission, saw children with disabilities begging on the streets. He couldn't ignore their desperation, and so he welcomed them into his home. He gave hope and healing to the forgotten children because the love of Christ left him no choice. But what does hope and healing look like today? Looks like me. Hope is healing. Hope is love. Hope is seed. Hope looks like me. Hope looks like me. Hope looks like me. Hope looks like me. <laughs> Hope is you. Let's pray together. Lord our God, we give you thanks for who you are and for all that you've done for us. And as we give today our offerings, we pray for your blessing upon them and for the work and ministry uh, through which this, these funds will help uh, us accomplish around the world. We pray for the ministry of our church. We pray for the ministry of Hope and Healing International. And Lord, we just pray that you would use this organization to share your love with those in deepest need. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we go to our God in congregational prayer, there's a few announcements that I just want to make. Um, Youth group is meeting this week, so especially if you are now a student going into or you've just started grade nine, you're invited to come out this week on Wednesday. It's going to be a night of, of more of social and games, getting together and connecting. So, so please come, have fun, hang out. It'll be good. There's a cadet camp out that's happening um, September 24th to 25th. Um, and so that that is going on. So if you are a parent of a boy who is birth year 2009 to 2013. Um, hopefully you've received that email. If not, Calvin is over there. Calvin, can you raise your hand? So Calvin is there. Or Rob. or Rob. You can talk to one of those two after if you have questions about cadets, if you want to know what's going on with the camp out, how to make that work. Uh, Saturday the 24th to Sunday the 25th, they're going to meet here, I think, at 8 in the morning on the 24th and go off, uh, do the camp out, and be back here on the Sunday. So that, that is happening. Um, if you are a golfer, the TCS Golf Tournament is happening on September 24th on that sa same Saturday as well. Um, if you have not registered, we're hoping to have all registrations in by Friday. Um, so please consider that as well. Um, and then... Most of us have received uh, an email, hopefully, or it's in, it's in, it was in the online bulletin as well. Um, but I received a message on Thursday afternoon from Tim Walter. So Tim, can you just stand up for a second? So Tim has, has had this passion to, to go and do ministry in, in Taiwan for a long time. <laughs> Tim messages me on Thursday afternoon and says, by the way, I just heard I'm leaving next week or this week now. Uh, on Thursday to go to language school in, in Taiwan. Um, 
So we are going to have uh, an opportunity to give a free will offering for Tim to support uh, Tim in this work as he goes to do this after the service during fellowship time. We'll have something out there to do that. Um, and then we can go and talk to him and ask him, like, how did this come about so quickly? And, and get, a, get an idea of what's happening and what's going on and what the plan is and all of that. Like, rather than, you know, Tim coming up and giving a couple minute thing, we're just, I invite you to please go and talk to Tim. Um, yeah, and, and give him an opportunity to share his heart about this ministry that he's, that he's hoping to do, but also just an opportunity to connect about, yeah, what, what's going on, you know, when he's leaving, what it's going to look like, all of that stuff. Um, you can ask him to teach you some Mandarin, um, too. You know, you know a little bit now. Yeah, so, so anyway, yeah, Tim's going to be gone for seven months to learn Mandarin, and so just an opportunity to support Tim after the service, um, but just go and chat with him, connect, figure out what's going on, and find ways that you can support him. Yeah, and we'll, we'll add him to the prayer list. You're already on the prayer list. We already got you, Tim. Good. All right. I think that's all I have. So. so this morning, we are going to finish our journey through the book of Colossians, Paul's letter to the church in Colossae. We are going to read chapter 4, verse 2. To the end of the letter, uh, verse 18, Colossians chapter 4, starting at verse 2. Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And pray for us, too, that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ, for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Tychius will tell you all the news about me. He is a dear brother, a faithful minister, and a fellow servant in the Lord. I am sending him to you for the express purpose that you may know about our circumstances and that he may encourage your hearts. He is coming with Onesimus, our faithful and dear brother, who is one of you. They will tell you everything that is happening here. My fellow prisoner, Aristarchus, sends you his greetings, as does, as does Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. You have received instruction about him. If he comes to you, welcome him. Jesus, who is also called Justice, also sends greetings. These are the only Jews among my co-workers for the kingdom of God, and they have proved a comfort to me. Epaphras, who is one of you and a servant of Christ Jesus, sends greetings. He is always wrestling in prayer for you, that you may stand firm in all the will of God, mature and fully assured. I vouch for him that he is working hard for you and for those at Laodicea and Heropolis. Our dear friend Luke, the doctor, and Demas send greetings. Give my greetings to the brothers and sisters at Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. After this letter has been read to you, see that it is also read in the church of the Laodiceans and that you in turn read the letter from Laodicea. Tell Archippus, See to it that you complete the ministry you have received in the Lord. I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. This is the word of the Lord. There are two words in the Greek language for time. There's chronos, and there's kairos. And so there's, there's chronos time, and there's, there's kairos time. Now, chronos time is, is calendar time. It's, it's the, the word where we get the word chronological from, so things that happen in order, things that we can measure. So, so chronos time is time that is, is measured by a clock or by the rising and the setting of the sun. And so we talk about Kronos time when we say that today it is Sunday, September 11th, 
2022 at 1044 in the morning. We, we talk about Kronos time and we say that today it has been 21 years since 9-11. All of those details, all of those details are talking about a measurement of time. A date on the calendar determined by our position as we orbit the sun and and by our position as we rotate on the earth's axis as we orbit the sun. It's time that we can measure. We talk about Kronos time when after the service, if we're talking with someone else and we set up a time to have coffee or to talk on the phone or if we're going to talk to our kids later today in a video chat and we say, okay, that's going to happen at five o'clock or let's do that on Wednesday at this time. We're talking about chronos time, things that are going to happen on a certain day at a certain time, a time that we can measure. Now in our modern sensibilities, Usually when we talk about time, this is the time that we're talking about. We're talking about chronos time. We look at our watch, we pull our phones out, we check the time, we put something in our calendar. We are talking about chronos time. When we read the news, when we think about things that have happened, events that happened in the past, when we can measure and remember a date or celebrate an anniversary, we're talking about chronos time time. But there's another word for time. Kairos. And Kairos time is a completely different idea. It's not measured by a watch or by a phone or by a calendar. In fact, Kairos time, in in its biggest sense, Kairos time cannot be measured at all. When someone says, It was an opportunity that I couldn't pass up. Or when someone says, this is our chance, this is our time, when a coach is trying to convince his team that this is our opportunity, it's our time to go out now and win the game. Or when someone says, everything came together in that moment and so we had to act. We're talking about Kairos time. Kairos time is not something you can measure and say this will happen on Wednesday or this will happen next week or this will happen at that time. Kairos time is the opportune time. It's the appointed time. It's the moment when you notice that everything is just right, when everything lines up. For those of you who are farmers or who grew up on a farm or have been driving through the countryside these days, we're getting a picture of Kairos time. As a farmer, you know that that when it comes to to making hay or harvesting wheat or corn silage or beans or, or corn or any other crop, it's not so much about measuring, well, I planted it on this day and so it's for sure going to be ready exactly 132 days later. That's not necessarily how it works. As a farmer, it's about watching the fields watching the crop, looking closely and determining at some point, now is the time. The crop is ready. The weather is right. That's Kairos time. It's not something you can measure, you know, and say this is going to happen on Wednesday, but you can measure by looking at it, seeing it, seeing how everything is coming together in that time, the appointed time. For those of us who aren't farmers, we, we also have Kairos time moments in our lives. You know, you might run into someone in the parking lot, someone that you've been, been meaning to talk to for a long time and you're getting groceries on Tuesday and you see them there and you've been wanting to talk to them, to, to thank them for something that they did, but you know they don't want attention for it and you've never had an opportunity to talk to just them alone. And you see them there in the parking lot, and you weren't thinking, oh, I'm going to go to the grocery store on Tuesday at 10.30 because I'm going to see this person. But when you do see them, you realize now is the time that I can say thank you. Now is the time that I can go and talk to them. Now is the time I can ask them about what's going on in their lives. It's an appointed time. 
It's a Kairos moment that in that moment, you know everything has lined up and you can take advantage of. You're invited to, to join in and to, to take part in this Kairos moment that you've been waiting for. There's Kronos time, and there's Kairos time, the appointed time, these moments that are full of meaning and purpose that we're invited to participate in, we're invited to, to take advantage of, to, to see that this is the time when we can do this. And now here in, in, in his closing instructions to the Colossians, as Paul is writing to this church, as he's reminded them about who Jesus is and, and that they are in Jesus, and, and amazingly, Jesus is also in them. And as Paul has taught them about the amazing fullness of God's grace that is theirs through Jesus and the impact that that has on the way that they live their lives and, and see the world around them. In all of this, Paul is inviting these new Christians that they live their lives not just in Kronos time, but that their lives are full of Kairos time as well. Their lives are, are full of all of these opportunities that they are invited into to, to witness to the goodness and the grace of Jesus, that they're invited to witness to and to live into this moment where Christ is in them. And so he is sending them as his people to live in this place and to show others who Jesus is. And there's something significant about that, that Paul is writing to this church, telling them that their lives are full of all of these opportunities, that their lives have purpose and meaning and all of these moments where God is at work and they're invited to join in. And it's significant because historians estimate that the church in Colossae was very small, maybe somewhere around a dozen people or so, maybe, maybe 20, but likely in that, in that area. So this is a small church. And if you, you remember, this church is, is located in a not so very important part of the world. In a world of Ottawa's and Toronto's and Montreal's, in a world of Rome's and, and, and Paris and London's, in a, in a world of Washington DC's, they were a Dixon's Corners. They were a Brinston a small, obscure, inconsequential town far removed from the places of power, far removed from importance and influence, far removed from people even knowing where they were. Nothing big happened in Colossae. Nothing of worldly significance, surely. It was a quiet place to live, it was a quiet place to be. Time in Colossae was measured in Kronos time. If you know what I mean, not in, in Kairos time. Because in order for there to be important and consequential moments, in, in order for there to be something important or something of any significance to happen, you have to live in a place where something important or something of significance actually does happen. And those kinds of things didn't happen in Colossae. I grew up in a small place in New Brunswick called Keswick Ridge. It's this rural area just outside of Fredericton, New Brunswick, about a 20 minute drive into the city to get anywhere that you really wanna be, at least in the city. And I remember that when I went to high school, I went to Fredericton High School, so you, you, it was the first time that I took this trip into the city for school. And I remember that some of the people that I met would kind of make fun of the place where I lived. They're like, you know, you, you're from Keswick Ridge? Like, how can you live out there? there? There's nothing going on out there. There's nothing to do. There's no place to go. There's more cows than people. Like, like, why would you live there? As, as if I had a choice as a 16-year-old where I was living. I mean, that was my parents' choice. But, but like, why would you live there? And in their minds, why would anyone live in a place like that? Like, if you had any choice, if you had any place to be, you would not pick there. You want to be where there's something going on, where there's something to do. Colossae was like Keswick Ridge. 
Colossae was like here. And when you live in a place like that, it's easy to think that because of where I am, because this place is seen as insignificant, because this place doesn't really matter, then I am insignificant. And in the grand scheme of things, my life is insignificant and my time is insignificant. But Paul opens their eyes to see that where they are, in Colossae of all places, in Dixon's Corners of all places, in Keswick Ridge of all places, that they have an opportunity to take part in the life and world-changing good news and the world-changing story of Jesus. Paul is telling them that their lives, yes, even their lives in that place are full of kairos moments. That their lives have purpose, that their lives matter, that things are happening around them that matter. There's moments that count. There are moments in their lives where God is at work. Moments in their lives where they, yes, even they out in the backwater town of Colossae are invited to participate in the work that God is doing in Jesus throughout the world. And in these closing verses, verses two through six, Paul is inviting them to see that that is what's going on. They are part of the work that God is doing in the world. They are part of the global spread of the good news about Jesus. They are taking part in the spread of the gospel and they are an integral part of that ministry. They matter. And so Paul invites them to a life of prayer. To a life of prayer, which is a life of conversation with God, where they are invited to look out into the world around them, to watch for the things that God is doing, and to be thankful. To watch for the things that God is doing in the world, that God is changing their hearts, that God is growing their church, that God is deepening their faith, that God is fortifying them against false gospels, that God is reminding them of all of the goodness and the grace of Jesus, that God is opening their eyes and the eyes of their neighbors to see Jesus in all of his glory in Colossae. And Paul is inviting them to give thanks to God for all that he has done and will do. Paul also asked them to pray for him. It's so easy for them to think, we need Paul. I mean, especially now as Paul is writing them this this letter, as Paul is clarifying to them and giving them this, this knowledge that they need to clarify who Jesus is and how they're called to live as Christians. But Paul needs them too. Pray for me. He says, he's saying, I need you. You may think you're in this place that doesn't matter. You may think that there's not a lot going on. I need you. I need your prayers. I need your support. I need you to pray for me so that I will follow God's will. I need you to pray for me so that I will proclaim the gospel clearly, even as I am in prison right now. Pray that I would have the courage and the boldness to clearly share about Jesus and so that God may open doors for this message to be heard. Pray for me. Paul saying, I need you. I need you at this time to pray for me. In this Kairos moment, as I am in chains for the gospel, I need your help, your participation your prayers that the door will be open for others to hear and respond to the good news of the gospel. You are part of this ministry. And Paul tells them to be wise in the way that you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Make the most of every kairos time. When Paul says that that line, make the most of every opportunity, he's using that word kairos. 
And so Paul's saying, yes, even in your community, even in your town, even out in the countryside where you feel so removed from the world, God is using you. He's using your words, your life, your example to tell the world about Jesus. And so live in a way that recognizes that God is using you, that that your life matters. Live in ways that honor God. Speak well of others and to others. Have grace for others. Be kind. Be confident in the hope that you have in Jesus. And in all of this, expect that God is using you. Expect that God is working through you and in the world around you. And when you have an opportunity to share the good news of of Jesus, when you have an opportunity to share the gospel and the hope that you have in Jesus, do it. And as Paul concludes his letter, inviting them to live in this Kairos time of sharing the world and life-changing good news of Jesus, he reminds them that they're not alone. All of these others send their greetings to. All of these other people who are at work throughout the world sharing about Jesus send them in Colossae their greetings. Another way of putting that is that that they, those who are in Colossae, are partners with all of these others who are doing the work of the gospel around the world. So in Colossae, they are part of sharing the news of Jesus with the whole world. They're part of Paul's ministry. They're part of Barnabas' ministry. They're part of John's ministry. They're part of all of these other people and all the work that they're doing in all of these other places. They are part of all of this. They matter. And God has called them where they are to be a part of this amazing and powerful work of Jesus in the world. All they need to do is to see that they are not living just in Kronos time. That they're not just passing their days, but they are living in Kairos time. In the appointed time to share the good news of Jesus, the good news of Jesus with us and Jesus in us with the world. For Jesus, God's own son, the one who created all things, and as Paul has told them, the one who holds all things and and all of us together, he has come. He has died. He has risen. He has ascended to heaven, and he is assuring us that, that in him, God assures us that in him our sins are forgiven, our hope is secure, our lives matter, and we are God's children now and for all eternity. Because eternal life is ours in Jesus. And he will come again to make all things right. And we will live in the glory and the peace of his presence for all eternity in the renewed and restored and perfect creation. And it will be good. This is the message that they have been given to live and to share. Now, if we're to measure the time using Kronos time, it's been almost 2,000 years since Paul wrote this letter. And in those 2,000 years, a lot has changed. Society, culture, the power structures, the world essentially has changed. But even though there's been plenty of Kronos time that has passed, we are still living in this Kairos time. Now is still the time to tell the world about Jesus. Now is still the time that God is at work in us and in the world, revealing his grace and love and truth in Jesus. Now is still the time even for us out here on a Sunday morning in Dixon's Corners, in a place that as far as the world is concerned has very little importance, now is still the time that we are called by God to join in the work that he is doing to make Jesus known. 
Now is still the time that we are called in our place, in our community, in our workplaces, in our homes, in our families to live our faith. And so we're called to pray. To pray for those who, like Paul, are sharing the gospel around the world. To pray for those who have this on their heart to go and share the good news. To pray for Tim as he goes to language school, as he takes this next step following God's call and leading in his life so that he can share the good news of Jesus. We're called to pray for our missionaries who are called in a particular way and to a particular place to share the good news of Jesus. We're called to pray, to watch for what God is doing around us, trusting that he is at work out in the world, trusting that he is at work in us, and to be thankful for the ways in which we are invited to participate and share God's love. We're called to pray for one another, for God has placed us here in the places that we live, with the neighbors that we have, with the coworkers who are beside us and that we share lunch with, with the families we spend time with each week as we watch our kids play sports, or as we go to school events, the friends that we hang out with at school or at sports or in Taekwondo, God has placed us in these places with these people to make the most of every opportunity that we have to live out the hope that is ours in Jesus, to share the gospel, to help point people to Jesus, to show them who Jesus is. And so we live in this Kairos time where we are invited to be kind and good neighbors and good stewards of our resources to live, as one author puts it, to live questionable lives. Sometimes we think that we have to be super Christians, that we have to go out and tell everyone about Jesus, that we have to have this whole gospel presentation memorized, and that we just have to go and tell them that, and that will take care of it all. But by living, as this author calls it, questionable lives, he means that that we are called to live lives that invite people to ask, why? Why do you do that? Why do you love or serve or give in that way? Why do you run your business like you do? Why do you not do this on that day? Why do you make decisions like that? Why do you, why do you love people even when they don't love you back? To live questionable lives so that as we are asked these questions, we have an opportunity to share the hope that we have and to give a clear answer that points people to Jesus. We may not be world famous. We may not be well known. People may not be able to point out where we live on the map. But none of that truly matters. What matters is that God is at work. And he's at work here. Just as he's at work around the world. And we are invited to be participants in this work. And like the Colossians, we are never alone. We work in partnership with our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world. But also like the Colossians, this work is not wholly our own either. As Paul reminds them, this is God's work. He is in control. He is carrying it out to completion. He is holding all things and he is holding us together. And so we are invited to participate. We are invited to live out our hope. We're invited to live in this Kairos time and be so assured that Jesus is holding all things and he's holding us. And our hope is only in him. Let's pray together. Lord, our God, help us to see in our day-to-day lives that you are at work and that we have a purpose. 
that you have called us in, in the particulars of our lives to be a witness for you. And you can use us no matter where we are. And so help us to live those questionable lives. Help us to, to recognize that in these moments, that there are kairos moments. There are opportunities for us. Help us to make the most of those opportunities and to live in ways that give glory to you. We pray this through Christ our Lord. Amen.
Tim, can I get you to come up here for a minute? You know, we're talking about Kairos moments and Kairos time, and you are leaving on Friday. So this seems like the right time and the right opportunity for us as a congregation to pray for you. So I'm going to get you to go stand down there. And if you would like to, or if you feel comfortable to, I'm going to invite some people to come and stand around you so that they can lay hands on you and we'll pray for you. So if you would feel comfortable coming forward, please do so. And then for those of us who are still in our, in our chairs, you know, we're surrounding you, Tim, in a way, just to make sure that you know that as a, as a congregation, this is a symbol for us of how we will be praying for you as you go to, to learn a new language, um, as challenging as that is, and to, to be able to share the gospel around the world. And so let's, let's pray for you. Lord our God, you go before us. And you are with us. And we thank you for that promise. And Lord, we pray that especially for Tim, on this day and in this week ahead, that he would know that you are with him, Lord, that you would surround him with your presence and your peace as he prepares to go. And Lord, in these months ahead, of learning a language, of living with a family, of speaking a new language and connecting with people, Lord, I pray that you would be with him, that you would strengthen him and encourage him and by your spirit that you would give him all that he needs. Lord, I pray too that in the midst of all of this, that as you have led him to this place and to this time and to this opportunity, that you would use him for the upbuilding of your kingdom and for the sharing of the good news of Jesus, our Savior. Lord, we thank you for his willingness to go and to follow as you have led. So we just pray for your blessing upon him in Jesus' name. Amen. And so Tim, and for all of us here, we go with God's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you his peace. And together we say, amen.
to be.